Um, to start, can I can I ask uh, the two students um, to please uh, show your faces? You, mute, you can mute yourself, but at least let's uh, all uh, show our faces. Teresa and um, I don't see the other name. You oh, scared, scared them off, I think. <laughs> Uh, I met Teresa yesterday. I'm sorry. I met Teresa yesterday on on this program. So. Uh, okay. All right. So we effectively have. Um, Taxi driving. Teresa. So that's just just one person. Um, okay. Um, hello, Teresa. Um, Hi. Hello. Welcome to um, to our information session. You you are our star of this event, uh, as you are the only student. So, uh, I, I can you, what year are you? I'm a junior. Junior, okay. Um, did you register for the class yet, or uh, you're still uh, looking into the possibility of registering? I haven't registered yet. I still have a. I, I'm still looking into my classes and planning them, paying off balances. Okay. All right. I see that you're driving. Um, I'm not. Um, just be careful, okay? <laughs> um, so we'll, we'll just uh, share some information, uh, and um, you you know how to reach us, right? I, I do, kind of, but I would prefer to, just in case, to make sure that I have the right information to be told again. Okay. Uh, Marcos, you, you, you'll you be able to know how to connect to get her information with the name, right? Um, so Marcos is going to send you an email. That way, you two are connected. And then from there on, you can get everything that, uh, that you need. Um, and uh, so... Um, I am one of the instructors of the course, and um, Dr. Ramri is the other. Um, he's just going to say a few things about the course, and uh, and it's okay if you want to block the um, if you want to shield the um, the video if you that, if you prefer. That's okay. You have introduced yourself. Um, I'm sorry. If the connection is better when I don't have the video on. Yeah, that's what I fear that you might start getting uh, reception problems. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, after that, uh, we invited uh, one of our, our partners uh, on the ground in um, the Galapagos, who is going to be uh, working with us to share some details about the program, what will happen when you actually get there. And uh, Johan, he's here to, to help with that. So, uh, Ram, uh, any uh, comment about this course before we pass it on to uh, Johan? Okay, hello, everybody. Um, uh, thank you for joining, who joined us, and thank you who missed it, but I hope you will watch the video later. So, the, I am the instructor here, uh, an associate professor, College of Agriculture, Human Science. I am teaching the natural resource and conservation management for past uh, three years. And we offer this course in every uh, each spring semester. We expect 25 to 50 students in this course every semester. So um, I think the this course, the purpose that we teach here in the in this uh, in Texas environment, and we also want to explore this type of uh, natural resource and conservation management issues and challenges, how the other country like uh, the Ecuador has the issues or something that we can explore and learn while we visit the, the, the Ecuador in the summer or summer actually, late spring. So that's I want to say a few words before we start the event. Thank you. Okay. All right, so thank you. Um, so, um, Johan, uh, why don't you then go ahead and just uh, share with our students some of the things they will do uh, uh, when uh, when we come um, uh, to the Galapagos. Sure. Uh, thank you for the invite to uh, this info session. 
My name is Johan Bessera, um, even though my account calls it the Intercultural Outreach Initiative, which is the organization that I founded and still lead. Um, founded it in 2006 as a marine research center, actually, and it has since developed into a sustainable development organization in the Galapagos Islands. Um, and I would like to share a quick presentation with you guys. Um, I will go through some of these photos, it's quite photo heavy, just to give you an idea of where you're going. And since Teresa is, uh, there's a couple more students signing in now. I was gonna say, since she's driving and not paying to the attention attention to the screen, um, uh, and this is being recorded for the web, I was gonna go through the pictures rather quickly um, so that people can pause uh, on the video more easily later. Um, and I will try and share the screen. Turn it into a presentation mode. Mm, so, way. <laughs> there you go. Can you see this guy? I hope. So you have to switch the screen. Yeah. Uh, the screen too. Stop the screen, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, say again, you're not seeing this guy? No, I said you, you you might want to swap the screen because you are not in presentation mode. You see, you have to go to the display settings and swap the screen. We are we are saying double double slide together. Yeah, uh, that's, the, to that's the one I want to see. <laughs> oh, okay. You have to swap the... How do I swap the screen? See the display settings? Go to display settings, drop down. Swap, there you go. Yeah. Now you're seeing it. Excellent. Now yeah, I got the presenter go. one. Thank you. Um, drawbacks of having lived in the Galapagos um, for eight years straight as technology revolutionized. I left for the Galapagos in 2005. It was a very remote island chain at the time. And I got back in 2012. So I left when everybody was just getting stick phones. And when I came back, everybody had an iPhone 3. <laughs> and I didn't know what it was. Uh, and so I, I lost a little bit of the tech revolution. Um, and I'm only getting slowly updated on Zoom. In any case, the Galapagos Islands um, is, of course, famous in many ways, mostly for Charles Darwin and the theory of evolution that he developed in the Galapagos. Um, a famous book written about is The Beak of the Finch. That being said, Galapagos wasn't, or the evolutionary theory from Darwin was not actually about finches when he figured it out, but about mockingbirds. Um, it was just recent uh, researchers that have um, gotten a bit more depth on the story uh, on a different island, Daphne Island, studying different species of finches. Um, so I'll start with some of the stuff that you're going to see, which is the giant tortoises might be the second thing that comes to mind. A lot of endemic animals in the Galapagos. Endemic meaning they exist in the Galapagos and only in the Galapagos. There are eight species of giant tortoises on the planet. Six of them live in the Galapagos and are endemic to the Galapagos. Other odd ones out um, are blue-footed boobies. There's also red-footed boobies. And their feet are what is red as these guys are blue. Uh, the lava gulls are the rarest seagulls in the world. Uh, the swallowtail gull is the, uh, the only nocturnal seagull in the world. There are frigate birds uh, with amazing courtship displays, land iguanas, marine iguanas, penguins, the northernmost penguins in the world. In fact, they usually live on the South Pole uh, and are substantially bigger down there. There's sea lions, which are native to the Galapagos, not endemic, meaning they occur in the Galapagos and also in other places. Uh, and the marine environment is quite diverse, making the Galapagos very unique in a sense that um, there's cold water currents and warm water currents flowing into these uh, islands. And therefore we have uh, tropical reef fish mixed in with uh, offshore pelagic cold water fish. Um, which makes for quite the marine diversity in terms of snorkeling, um, diving, and research. Um, all kinds of sharks, there's tons of sharks in the Galapagos, but also, especially in the colder time of year, charismatic, charismatic megafauna, 
uh, such as whales, dolphins, and manta rays in this case. The Galapagos Islands um, is actually further east than you've probably expected. At least it was when I was living up here in Miami for the longest time, as I mentioned earlier. I figured, like Hawaii, you know, it's far out in the Pacific Ocean and maybe somewhere south of Hawaii, right? Off the coast of South America. Well, it is off the south of, uh, coast of South America. It just so happens that South America actually sits way more east of North America than you expect. Miami, being on the east coast of the U.S., is directly north of Guayaquil, which is a, the major port city in Ecuador, on the west coast of South America. So Guayaquil and Miami are directly on the same um, longitude, whereas the Galapagos Islands sit almost directly south of you. In fact, east of where you guys are in Prairie View, it's directly south of New Orleans. Uh, it consists of 13 major islands and a bunch of rocks. Only three islands are inhabited. Isabella Island, the big seahorse-shaped one where we are located, and Puerto de Amil. Puerto Llora, which is the big port um, town, and Puerto Baquerizo Moreno on San Cristobal Island, uh, where the government sits. On the southern coast of Isabella, Puerto de Amil is a beach town. It's the only settlement on this giant island. Um, about... The last census was about 3,000 people, probably more four to 5,000 at this point, uh, though I don't have any post-pandemic numbers yet. And we're sitting right here at the end of the beach. Uh, in the zoomed in version, this is our location, uh, directly across from a five kilometer beach with hardly anybody on it. Reverse view, this is our port, where we'll be landing when we get there. Um, a lot of good snorkel sites, marine research sites, a lot of mangrove environment, coastal ecosystems right here, of course, the Long Beach. And then behind us, behind the camera view, so to speak, as you can see in the next picture, which is a picture of the town, you see the slopes of Sierra Negra Volcano, which is uh, a shield volcano, and has the second largest caldera in the world. Uh, a caldera in, um, is a crater that has collapsed and then fills and collapses rather than, you know, like Mount St. Helens that has an explosive deep crater where stuff gets thrown out here in a, in a caldera, lava flows in, forms a lake, often freezes over. And then as the lava retreats, the um, lava lake collapses. It's almost like a frozen lake in the winter time when you drain the water, if you were to drain the water. It is the second biggest caldera in the world. On the way up, we have several different climate zones those are the prevailing winds hitting the slopes of the volcano. And as you can see, the coastal zone is pretty arid, whereas um, the orographic precipitation that happens when moist air rises against the mountainside and cools off um, creates a more wet environment for agriculture um, on the slopes of the volcano, which is something we're trying to leverage for our sustainability programs, which I will go into in a minute. This is IOI. Uh, in fact, this is no longer IOI. Uh, this is IOI pre-pandemic. During the pandemic, we built a new IOI. And this is it. It is now actually finished. I just don't have the new pictures yet. But you will get brand new facilities um, upgraded and uh, bigger and more towards our purposes um, than what we had before. So what is also special about the Galapagos? I like this little graph on the right. Uh, where you can see our trajectory as humans and how we interact with the planet, from fencing ourselves in to protect us from the environment to nowadays fencing in nature preserves to protect nature from us. And that is exactly uh, why the Galapagos is of such interest for conservation purposes. Galapagos it retains 95% of its original biodiversity, pre-human biodiversity, which makes it one of the only places where we can actually still do protection of nature rather than restoration. Most other places we have to restore nature to its original state. Here, we can still protect it from humans such as the first picture. In fact, 97% of the Galapagos, uh, the Galapagos looks like this, uh, you know, 8,000 BC uh, graphic up here. The Galapagos is 97% national park and human settlements are very much confined to these small settlements uh, on the coast and a small uh, dedicated agricultural zones up the volcano. Conservation history in the Galapagos. Conservation is a pretty new concept. Um, 
It only really started after World War II. Before that, there was very few people and a lot of planet, uh, and resources seemed infinite. So uh, only in the early 50s, uh, starting from oil pollution in, in the North Sea, I believe, in Europe, um, is when we started to really feel impacts of um, humanity on the planet. Um, and the Galapagos, therefore, as a very remote location, was dedicated very early on um, as a protected area. The IUCN and UNESCO did initial ex expeditions in the 50s. In the 60s, the National Park was established. In the 70s and 80s, um, various dedications of biosphere reserve, marine reserve, whale sanctuary, etc. cetera, uh, World Heritage Site status were added. Uh, in 1998, right here is a, um, is a, where's my laser pointer, is a um, key date because a special law, the LOREC, is the Ley, Ori, um, Ley Régimen Especial de Galápagos, Ley, Ori, Ley Origen Régimen Especial de Galápagos, the special law of Galápagos, uh, was put into action to protect the Galápagos Islands from migration. There was a lot of um, a fisheries boom in the 90s and led to a lot of migration to the Galápagos. Uh, threatening the biodiversity there, and Ecuador put into place um, basically a, a, a migration law similar to U.S. immigration um, for foreigners, uh, only that in the Galapagos there is no path to residency or citizenship. Even Ecuadorians, if you're from Ecuador mainland, you cannot live in the Galapagos permanently unless you come for a temporary work visa. Um, you marry in or you get born there. Those are your, your three options, basically. And the first one being temporary. Two-year contract, once renewable, four-year maximum. I lived there for eight years, I said. If you caught that distinction, uh, that law has been reformed several times and the four-year, one-term limit or two-term, one-year, one-time renewable was put into place in a reform in the administrative reforms of 2015. Another key date is 2008, Ecuador got a new constitution. Uh, after socialists got into, into power and put themselves up for re-election under a new constitution. Um, this is probably the most progressive constitution in the world. Um, little did it go noticed in the rest of the world. But for conservation purposes, what's special about this constitution is that the um, Ecuadorian constitution gives, gives nature a judicial person, i.e. anybody in Ecuador can go to court in the name of nature, get sued or mainly sue somebody for damages done to it. Very progressive, uh, very timely concept of who pays for and gets sued for environmental damages as uh, we are in the second week of November, if you guys watching this recording later and currently happening is the COP27, the conference of the party of the parties um, to the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, the 27th follow-up conference that is, reaffirming the goals of the Paris Agreement in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt. And that is one of the main topics of who pays for reparations. In the Galapagos, you can see here migration. I, I, I harped on it a little bit earlier, why these, uh, this is an important issue. When there was nobody living there, well, that's why the Galapagos still has all of its biodiversity. There was no humans to destroy it. Um, and you can see how the residents in this top line uh, have increased and the number of visitors actually got a more exponential growth yet. We are currently pre-pandemic and on track for 2022, post-pandemic again, uh, going on 275,000 visitors to the Galapagos per year with a population pretty stable at no longer 20,000, but going on 30,000, even though the latest uh, census is pre-pandemic, so we don't exactly know on the resident side. However, you can see that the special law for Galapagos instituted in 1998 um, put a little ding in the growth numbers. Most of this is um, internal growth from birth rates, which since the law also have declined. So this curve is, is flattening off. The main problem in the Galapagos is invasive species, as you might imagine, since there's so much endemism 
species that are only there, they involved, evolved there to these very specialized um, species because they had no natural predators. An invasive species is something that we bring in and therefore uh, often is a predator to a local species, an endemic species, or outcompetes it, um, taking away resources that these animals and plants can use. And you can see this is a long scale if you look at the years and centuries. So it's not quite as exponential maybe as it may look, but it is increasing and it is the main threat to the Galapagos. Other than that, increasing tourism and migration is what causes the you know, introduction of invasive species. Water and sanitation, uh, public infrastructure uh, is what is um, under threat from just overuse and lacks, lack of taxation to pay for new systems and lack of enforcement of existing regulation. Um, and therefore the, 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 the system is just overloaded on, on all accounts. The solution to that, uh, of course, is sustainable development because what is happening there and has happened in the past and the rest of the world is quite unsustainable. I'm sure you've heard of the concept. We established it in the 80s um, in a report. Um, it's called the Brunt Bruntland Report, famously. And it looks at different lenses of how to address sustainability in the middle, not just talking about the environment anymore, but also talking about the economics and the social impacts of our policies and looking at that through global, national, and regional, read local lenses. Um, IOI, the organization that I founded, as I mentioned, has turned into a sustainable development organization. Um, since it was founded in 2006, we provide carbon and negative study abroad and volunteering programs in Galapagos and Cuba. Cuba currently being suspended due to the political situation between the US and Cuba, unfortunately. Uh, what we do is we are the nexus between international education, you guys, and local conservation and development needs. Um, all of our programs are aligned with the UN SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, that is. And we try through education, um, research and volunteering, create a sustainable development framework in the Galapagos. How do we do that specifically? Well, we have outreach projects, uh, conservation projects, social development projects, economic development programs that we run with our staff, with the local government, and with our temporary volunteers and interns. Um, then we have research projects, usually university students and professors that come in to inform us on what we're doing on a given topic. Say we want to establish a sustainable agriculture program, but we're not experts in sustainable agriculture. So we're finding us a partner university uh, in sustainable agriculture that tells us what we then relay to the local government and local farmers um, uh, to make agriculture um, less carbon intensive in the Galapagos. And then we, edu we after the, the, the groups leave, then our volunteers, the community, our interns and our staff execute those programs year round. So if we include uh, and encourage local integration and participation in the programs that our universities um, draw up um, and by their execution saves us a lot of money and financially integrates it through the US education system into local development. Long and the short of all of this is your participation is driving sustainable development in the Galapagos. So what have we done concretely in the Galapagos? Uh, we do education capacity building. Um, a lot of that goes into the community, of course, but a lot of it goes into institution buildings. We work a lot with the local governments, uh, associations, um, and have focus groups ourselves, uh, from female empowerment and quality of life to environmental ed and summer camps and scout groups, like youth education. We run vet and medical campaigns. We do social infrastructure development. We do, of course, research in all relevant fields driven by our partner universities like you guys and we work in sustainable agriculture and fisheries to protect the local environments. Uh, here you see some photos of our regenerative agriculture program uh, as, a, as a case study, so to speak, uh, in regenerative agriculture since you're an A&M school. Um, we have a field school with the uh, Farmers Association uh, where we train farms in sales and marketing, uh, 
work with the local government to give the farmers access to loan programs. We established agritourism on some farms. Uh, we encourage reforestation and promote migratory corridors for local species so that on the way up and down the volcano, you know, this strip of farming doesn't cut off the natural migratory patterns of endemic species. And then, um, of course, we work in farm management, also uh, driven mainly by the University of Illinois and Urbana-Champaign um, and their research on how to make agriculture more organic by reduction and elimination of pesticides, herbicides, soil restoration, water conservation, and the integration of ungulates, that is huffed animals, into agriculture in order to more naturally fertilize uh, in a no-tilling rotational grazing manner. Uh, most of this aimed at um, our, our goals of um, carbon neutrality. I'm sure you've heard of carbon offsets with this regenerative agriculture program and regenerative production. Uh, we are insetting our carbon emissions for this program. Our stage one and two emissions, i.e. our direct emissions and our um, electricity use and energy use emissions get not offset, but inset, that is an in-house offsetting, so to speak, rather than sending it away to some reforestation projects, we do that ourselves. Uh, while we then still offset your flights to get there, um, because our program is not yet big enough to deal with that giant uh, impact, because flying is one of the more carbon intensive things you are doing in your current lives, or will probably ever do in your lives. Um, as a carbon neut neutral organization, of course, that's the 800 pound gorilla in the room that we need to address. We're saying, hey, we're doing something for the environment, but then flying our participants thousands of miles across the planet. Um, we also have a breeding program with the National Park where we breed um, the uh, giant tortoises off the Galapagos, six of the different species, all of them are in the center, and our empowerment groups um, take our research and work into town um, for social econ socioeconomic development, uh, as well as supporting our sustainable agriculture program with urban farming. We're a very small organization, but have what I think is an outsized impact for our size. We've had over $5 million invested in local projects, uh, 84 of them in three key areas, conservation, education, and social development, run over a thousand workshops, treated over 2,000 patients in public health campaigns and over 1,500 animals in uh, our invasive species protection program. We got four ongoing research programs um, with our partner universities in the US, um, have hosted over 24 graduate research programs. If you get an appetite for research in the Galapagos from this trip, we're happy to see you back as a um, graduate student doing some research. We invested into local agri uh, infrastructure pro projects, um, over half a million dollars, which doesn't sound much in the US context, but is a lot of money in Ecuador. Uh, we have 10 staff from five different countries and host over 250 volunteers and students per year and have over 50 women and youth in our empowerment programs that serve as multipliers into the community. These projects uh, are from teaching English in the school to uh, creative environmental art settings and systems with the, with the kids in town to um, female empowerment programs promoting non non against domestic violence to um, girls sports programs to public health campaigns, dental to vet campaigns, uh, research and breeding programs with the National Park. And then of course, I'll work with the students, students groups like you guys like this as a group from the University of Miami, I believe take such transports and these uh, in a different medium, of course, uh, to go to places like this, uh, Sierra Negra Volcano. As I mentioned, you can see it's pretty big. This is all crater and then more to the right of the picture. Um, the second largest caldera in the world, uh, along with our pristine beaches um, and our right offshore snorkel sites uh, for marine research where our students then do activities in these environments, like hiking down into said uh, volcano to up here, what is uh, active sulfur mines for geology research or marine research, uh, working in fisheries, or just for playing and snorkeling um, 
and enjoying what the Galapagos has to offer. And with that, I will open it to questions, if there are any. Great, super, that, that is awesome, thank you. Yeah, I'm gonna <clears throat> open it up to questions. Um, yeah, so if any student has a question, please, or anybody, uh, perhaps I could start with one. Um, in that last, uh, in one of the last pictures you shared there, um, you talked about teaching English in one of the schools. Is that uh, one of the programs you also run? Yes, we have that as a program also. Okay, that is good because it, then it actually offers me another uh, opportunity here to bring in our education department um, on, on some of this um, as we look into this. So that's that's super. All right. Um, so to you, the students, uh, please uh, ask your questions. Um, we are going to uh, put this presentation on our website uh, so you can look, take a closer look later, but please feel free to ask any questions you might have now. I don't have, I don't have any, any questions. I'm more so, um, but just uh, wanted to ask about the deadlines of when we would have to have money to be able to participate. And I also wanted to know like, when do we get, do we get to pick the specific program that we want to participate? Or is there, it's just one program that we are allowed to participate in? Like, are we allowed to participate in more than one program or are we only allowed to participate in one? And when do we pick which program that is? So I, I, think, I, I think she's speaking to like the itinerary. So um, in, in short, Johan just presented like a wide range of, of things that could be done uh, on the group, the prayer view group who will participate. Um, but essentially there'll be an itinerary where um, between Dr. Ram and, and Dr. Godlove, uh, I'm assuming uh, there's, uh, activities are already scheduled for, for each day. And so I, I think that's what the question is getting at. Yeah, so uh, in the course description online, you do have an itinerary attached to it, is there? If not, we can share the, the itinerary for, uh, that we have, uh, the draft itinerary we have for the uh, program so you can see if, um, what, what activities uh, will, they will engage in. Uh, so if it's not yet there, we'll, we'll have it there and Marcus will share it with all of you. So, so, I'm sorry, in terms of deadline, of course, I'll pass that right back to Marcus. Um, but in terms of itinerary, um, to answer the question or maybe get closer to it, at the risk of throwing God, Love, and Ram under the bus here a little bit, um, <laughs> this is a, a first time we're running this course. So it's a bit of an exploratory itinerary. We have put together what we think is the best itinerary for your curriculum. Um, since it is a first though, uh, we can be very adaptive on the ground. It is designed to have group activities as a group together, both excursions and um, civic engagement programs, service learning programs. However, as a suggestion, since you're bringing it up, Teresa, I think it was, um, we could split the group and work on different projects in parallel, uh, if that's something uh, Doctors Godlove and Ram are interested in. I I, I think um, it is a, a brilliant idea um, that to have students weigh in on what they do well on the ground within the limits of what you guys can manage. Uh, I think the way the course is going to be presented is such that. Um, we're not going to be too specific uh, uh, since you, these are the only things you could do while there. There's so much to do there. And I think that uh, as a class, we'll get together and figure out how to accommodate people's needs. People could express specific interest on some things they want, and we'll try to accommodate those. We'll, do, we'll be as flexible with that part of it as, as much as possible. I think, I think uh, just I want to add something like once we have the complete group, We'll, we'll, we'll go through the survey, like what are the interest of you guys, the students' interest, like particular looking for, and then we can have 
make uh, some groups and then we can try to accommodate those interests, how much we can fit based on our curriculum and also based on available resource and the locations on the projects that uh, uh, I will, I have it. So to speak. And yes, you all are going to have the opportunity to spend some time on the beach. So you don't have to worry about that. That is if you choose a project on the beach. <laughs> Otherwise, no. <laughs> okay, and to speak to the, the deadline, uh, in terms of applications, um, currently the upcoming deadline is set for November 15th. So if, if you haven't already completed your application, um, please log on to studyabroad.pvmu.edu. I'll put that in the chat for you just, just for reference. And you'll be able to log in using your PVMU credentials. And under programs, you'll see the PVMU Galapagos Islands program for agriculture, the natural resource conservation management course listed under our faculty-led programs. So once you click that, um, it'll automatically create the application for you. And there's essentially a, a checklist of items that you'll need to complete. Um, and again, the current deadline to get that done uh, has already been extended from November 1st to November 15th, which is next Tuesday. Uh, so I say definitely try to get that application in as soon as possible. And then regarding uh, payments, um, we're also asking for deposits. And so the out of call, the out of pocket expense for students on this program is going to be seven hundred dollars. And so and just for reference, the total cost for this is, is three thousand dollars total. But we've worked very hard to keep the price down and come up with some scholarship funding uh, for you all as well through the International Programs Office and also the College of Agriculture. So all students uh, who are approved to participate will be responsible for is $700. And uh, we'd like to get a, a, um, a deposit of $500 uh, by December 15th. Uh, from you all for this program. And then the other 200 that you'd be responsible for would be due by February 1st. And uh, let me just add that, um, uh, as you can hear, see from what Michael said, uh, we worked really hard to make this program uh, um, affordable to you. Um, because we think it's a very important program. It's a destination that we think you're gonna learn a lot from, but we don't have unlimited money. So um, at some point we'll run out of enough scholarship money and those who register very late cannot have it at this cost. So if you want to get this uh, program at $700, you have to do uh, register quickly. Um, and then, um, then you can be assured that uh, beyond your five hundred dollars, the only other thing is two hundred, and that that is the cost for everything. Um, and if you don't have a passport, let us know. We also have a different scholarship for that to help you uh, with with uh, with passport with your passport. So I actually need help getting my passport. So that means they can register by 15, but uh, deposit can be paid by December 15. Am I right? Yes. Okay, good. So that that's information you not on the website. So if you correct it, the student will be not confused. So one student has asked me question the same. Do I have to pay deposit by this um, November 15th or December 15th? So I said it will be clear on the info session. And if you if you have friends who you think might like this, tell them. Sometimes people enjoy their study abroad experiences when they are also traveling with uh, with their friend who may be interested. So there is still space in the class. Um, so um, again, we get to the point where um, we may get to a point where the amount goes up. We are not there yet. There is room at this point.
I just had a really quick question. I'm not a student, obviously, but uh, Johan, you used the phrase uh, charismatic megafauna. I was just really curious what makes them charismatic. Do they tell jokes in their own animal language? That was a joke, but I was just curious. If you could just tell us a little bit more about that. Everybody loves dolphins, man. <laughs> you know, it, nobody cares about a fly, you know, like it's an animal just like a dolphin or a whale, but it's not charismatic. You tell me why a dolphin is more charismatic than a fly. They're both a nice little animal important to this planet. But, you know, that's why they call them such. Um, big things, you know. From, you know, the big game in Africa or the tigers in India or, the, you know, the sharks and whales and mantas in the Galapagos. It's popular everywhere. Thank you. So the population that you showed there, the 20,000 or something, that's for this island or that's for the whole country? That's island, right? Uh, the 20,000 is for the entire archipelago. So for all of Galapagos. Isabella Island has about 3,000. Oh, okay. Very small town. Right. More, so, more visitors than residents. Yeah, yeah. That's what, I was confused that he's saying differently. Yes. More visitors per year, probably a one to 15 ratio between inhabitants and visitors, mm. which is a recent development. When I went there, um, we didn't even work anybody in tourism. It was a fishing town, which is why Galapagos in terms of ecotourism, which is, you know, conservation and ecotourism is, is my research interest as uh, a very exciting place um, because we're basically redesigning from scratch a tourism industry that has not existed even 15 years ago. The Galapagos 15 years ago, when I went there in 2005, 17 years ago, I'm getting old, um, did not have internet connection, did not have cell phone reception, um, did not have television, you know, none of this. It was very remote. Now we have all of those things and things are changing quickly. Uh, fishing at the time when I went there, overfishing was the main environmental threat. Um, and IOI, including all the other big NGOs, WWF, Conservation International, Charles Darwin Research Station, all of the guys, everybody was pushing for ecotourism as an alternative to unsustainable fisheries. And we all thought it was a panacea. Turns out it was Pandora's box. And we should have been smarter at the time, I suppose. Um, a lot of that, unfortunately, though, is getting pushed by environmental NGOs. And uh, IOI is... The first and still the only in Isabella, anyways, NGO that's actually working on sustainable development. Uh, often in conservation, as these things go, you know, it's it's very monofocused. Protect this animal, this ecosystem, this island. Very limited in scope, um, and that had negative socioeconomic consequences, which is why the concept ultimately failed. Um, and we needed something that is better integrated with human life. You cannot exclude humans um, for, and separate them from the planet, right? And that's fortress conservation, as they call it, um, is a concept that's failed, clearly, uh, for the entire planet. Um, and the Galapagos is almost a, you know, under the microscope case study of how we can um, integrate environment and, and humanity a little better. So, Kara and Sydney, what any comment on what you've heard? What do you think about what you've heard so far? Um, I don't have any questions so far, but um, I'm really interested in the trip. Um, as far as what he said, like the information in the slides and stuff. Okay. Um, well, so actually, I do have a question. Is yeah. our deposit due on the 15th or we're, we're able to pay on in December is what I heard? Marcos, you're muted. Yes, you have until December 15th. Um, so basically for... For you all's program, since the, the out-of-pocket cost is, is so low, um, one of the 
one of the deposits are, are not necessary. So generally, we would have asked that you all had two deposits paid by December 15th. Um, but because it's only $700, we can we can um, limit that to two. And so uh, the sooner the better, because we want to be able to get your um, your flights as soon as possible uh, while they're more affordable. Um, but if you need a little more time, we can we have until December 15th uh, to get those five hundred dollar deposits in. And then you have February 1st to pay off the additional two hundred. OK, thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you all notice that uh, Marcus has put the email address in the chat for you guys to reach him with uh, more questions beyond this? Sydney, um, what do you, I don't understand your question. Is 15, is the 15th still the announcement date? Are you talking about for um, basically kind of confirmation that you've been approved to participate? Is that what you're question? Yeah, so I would say by Thanksgiving, give or take, uh, we'll have sent out uh, notices. And so once you get the approval notification that you've been approved to participate, you'll have to go into the study abroad website into your application and commit to the program. And then once you actually commit to it, uh, it'll give you another checklist of items that you'll need to complete things like trainings, uh, up uploading your passport information, confirming that you've registered for the course, those types of things. Okay. All right. Well, um, any other questions? Oh, um, okay. Somebody said, how do we register? That's the question you just answered, right? Um, okay. No, so, so this is, I think Ram was talking about this a, a bit earlier in terms of um, registering for the course, registering for the class. There's a lot, some hiccups you said that, that are going on. Was that right, Dr. Ray? Uh, I, I'm not sure if she, uh, she's talking about register to course or register to this program. Think so. Sydney's already completed her application. She's already applied to the program. Yeah. Um, and so it's. I think she's asking how does she register for the course. So yeah, she can contact me if there is an issue to register the course. I don't think there is any issues, but if there is issue, then I can figure it out and I can help her. Okay. Just reach me out, let me write my email. Awesome. Okay. Um, I believe that was all my questions. Perfect. Uh, so I'm just ready to sign up. Awesome. Awesome. And I just got your email with your info. Miss Lewis, so I'll follow up with um, additional details that you need as well. So we don't register for it. Yes, Sydney, you, you do need to register for the course. The course is AGRA 1301, Natural Resource Conservation Management. And let me type that in the chat for you. But this is this is a course you need to register for in the spring semester for next semester. So registration just opened this week. Um, so definitely try to get registered for this course. And again, if you have any issues registering for it, just uh, reach out to Dr. Ray. Okay, awesome. I already took that class with this, uh, Professor Ray. Right. Um, I was wondering if I needed to, uh, if we needed to take an updated course or just that one, are we in to five? Can Can you weigh in on, on that, Dr. Ray? Yeah, she already taken this course. I know she's, uh, I don't know what circumstances that she had to register again this course. I don't think because she already taken. 
No, um, it's not an issue for our office in general. So sometimes we have faculty who, for whatever reason, they taught the class and the students weren't able to go, say, because of COVID for or, or some other reason. Um, and so uh, the faculty will make the travel component available to the students, again, who've already taken the class without them needing to register for it. Um, if anything, sometimes they just have to take like a special topics course or something to that effect um, so that basically they can stay in, in the loop with any specifics that are regarding the actual travel component. And so it's just a matter of, of knowing that uh, Miss Lewis, in this case, already took the class and so that she's still getting the, the information that's uh, travel pertinent pertinent to travel um, since she won't actually be in the class. So um, does that make sense? Does that work? Yeah, I think so. But maybe it's because she, she's already taking other courses with other faculty and she already taken this course, so I don't think there will be any issues. Okay. If, no, if nobody else has anything else, I uh, want to thank y'all for your time. Yeah, that was, that was really good. Really appreciate the, all the participation. Great to, to have you all here. Uh, looking forward to having you be part of the program. Uh, Johan, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate you taking the time to uh, assist us with this. And uh, we'll share a recording of this uh, on our website for the students who were not able to attend. And um, we'll just keep working with you and um, we'll be back in touch. Okay, if the time, if there's a time conflict, if there is a time conflict, let me know. And I can, I can offer the special course. Perfect. I have done before, so that's not a, that will not be an issue that will stop you going there. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. You have a good day. Okay. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye.